Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar with Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Matthew Monagle. I'm the web manager here at uh, Executive Education. And if this is your first webinar, we're glad to have you. Just a few housekeeping tips. We're going to hold all questions until the very end. Um, our guest today is going to deliver about 20 minutes of lecture, and then we're going to make sure we have 10 minutes or so at the very end to answer some questions. Uh, if you want, as the presentation goes along, feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll make sure that we gather them up and ask the ones that, uh, that we feel we have time for at the very end. As always, too, we are going to upload a full recording of this webinar at uh, the end of probably about uh, two or three days from now, so keep an eye out for that. And today I have the great privilege of introducing our guest, Peter Bell. Peter is the uh, faculty director of our Digital Literacy for Decision Makers program at Exec Ed. He's also an adjunct lecturer at Columbia Business School. And if that wasn't enough, he's the CEO and CTO of Wheelhouse.io, a company that provides software to teach developers new skills. So thank you so much for joining us today, Peter. Matthew, thank you so much. Just checking that the audio is coming through okay? Great. So, Matthew, thanks so much, and everyone, thank you for joining us today. So, the goal of this session is to talk about some of the strategic implications of technological disruptions. I've been involved day to day in the startup world for a number of years. I ran the engineering team at General Assembly. I've worked with lots of founders of early stage and later stage companies, often to help them to build and manage engineering teams. But today, what I want to talk about are some of the implications of the changes we're seeing in the technology landscape and how we're seeing them starting to impact traditional businesses and organizations. And we're going to be covering a bunch of points, so I'm going to go through these real quick and I'm looking forward to some, hopefully some lively Q&A at the end. So the, the trail to scale. Despite the sounds of unicorns dying in uh, boardrooms and fields uh, across the world, there has still been more value created over the last few years by early stage fast growth startups than at any other comparable time in history. You look at even companies like WhatsApp, where they had a small team, 55 employees, 32 engineers, and in a year and a half they created an organization that was acquired for $16 billion. Uh, with an additional $3 billion of grants to the founders and engineering team to keep them around uh, when Facebook did the acquisition. They had gone from zero users to half a billion users in a year and a half. And while there were certainly some unsustainable parts about the, the recent venture cycle, and I, I think we're, it's quite clear over the last three to six months that that's been cooling down and that we're seeing a return to sane valuations and the fact that eventually you need to have price to earning multiples that can be sold in the public market as the IPOs open again, there is still the ability to create scale and size in time frames and with very small resources that really just didn't exist in the past. And an important component of this is to start to think more broadly about competition. Because historically, competition were the companies that were clearly and definitively in the same business as you. But I, I think the best way of thinking about competition these days is using the jobs to be done framework that comes from Clayton Christensen, probably best known for his work on the innovator's dilemma. And the underlying principle is that you should look at the job that your product or service is being hired to do. What is the problem you're actually solving in someone's life? Because often you'll find that other people are being hired to solve the same job without necessarily being in your industry. There is some argument that uh, whether you're creating a video game, whether you're creating uh, a newspaper, or whether you're creating a book, or a TV series, in all of these cases, at least one of the jobs to be done, one of the things you're being hired to do is to entertain somebody. And because of that, we're finding a much wider range of competitors kind of coming into our spaces just because they have access to a global scale and have access to, to come at this in different ways. We've certainly been seeing over the last couple of decades, if not longer, 
the, the battle for attention with TV viewership decreasing, more people moving to the internet, and then this kind of ex Cambrian explosion of apps and internet sites and games and other ways to, to engage with our, our customers. And we, we're kind of hitting this tipping point where it's always been fairly straightforward to build a website or to get an app built. You know, you throw twenty or fifty or a hundred thousand dollars at someone, and now you have a new iOS app. But unfortunately, only so many apps are going to get downloaded and become part of somebody's everyday life. So we're seeing this challenge now, where the problem is not building something. And in fact, the, we see even in areas like YouTube, where there's now this explosion of content producers, there's not the barriers that they used to be to content creation, but now there is substantial barriers to meaningful adoption in terms of actually getting enough people to know about and care about the functionality or the content you're creating. One of the trends that I think this is driving is a real focus on the importance of education. It was interesting, I was just rereading The Challenger Sale, which for anybody in uh, responsible for B2B sales knows is this kind of new trend towards the idea that it's not enough just to meet with your prospects and ask them lots of questions about what keeps them up at night, the, the kind of traditional solution selling and spin selling approach, but rather you need to focus on educating or informing them of potential solutions that could add value to their organization and then working with them to customize it to their specific needs. If you're not telling your prospects something, they probably don't want to take your call in a business-to-business -business environment. And the, similarly, uh, in both business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer worlds, the whole idea of content marketing is becoming a huge part of how you get meaningful attention from people in terms of teaching and informing them about things that relate to the products or services that, that you offer. A trend that I've been seeing, especially over the last three or four years, which kind of pulls a couple of these elements, the importance of education and the battle for attention together, is the rise of the platform. Just take a moment and think about your smartphone. How many apps do you have on it? Now it depends. I, I see people with 5, 10, 15 apps, and I see people with two or 300. My next filter would be, of all of the apps on your personal smartphone, how many of them did you use within the last week? For most people, this substantially narrows the number. Right now we're coming down to five apps, or maybe 10 or possibly 15 apps on a regular basis. I want you to bear in mind that we've got the kind of default apps that you'd expect, the calendar and the email and the texting, probably Facebook, maybe LinkedIn, maybe one or two others. There's not that much room left to get in front of people uh, to get their attention. And so the challenge then becomes how can it's difficult to just go build your own mobile app and persuade large numbers of people to download and engage with it on a regular basis. In fact, many of the businesses we deal with, we simply have no need to get an app from them or to, to check it on, on a frequent basis. So the opportunity then and the threat becomes how can you leverage platforms? Tools like WhatsApp around the world or Facebook would be the most obvious one in the US. How can you leverage the attention that they already have to better get in front of your customers? Obviously through things like Facebook ads, but especially with M, a new conversational commerce interface that, that Facebook's working on, how can you build tools that will add value to your customers and still allow you to engage with them through major platforms like Facebook that already exist? It's been interesting to me that this whole kind of trend of user interfaces differentiator. I remember in the early days where we started to see this, people were like, oh, I want to use FreshBooks, not Quicken for my small business, because it's easier, because it's got this kind of web 2.0 feeling to it, as people would have said five or six years ago. But that's expanded, especially with the, the move towards now uh, more people are using most of the consumption of media and content now is coming from mobile devices rather than just desktops. And 
as such. You see things like Uber, which really a lot of the value proposition is it's, it's kind of the McDonald's of transportation, right? You know that whichever city you fly into, you can probably pull up an Uber X, you're going to get a vehicle that has a passable rating, you know it will take a credit card, and it has GPS, so they're not going to ask you whether or not you want to take the loop to get downtown or whatever the details are of, of getting driven around in that particular city. I think the interfaces differentiator in some ways has gone too far. This idea that, you know, if there's an app for it, then that in itself is, is an opportunity. But companies, the, my, my favorite was wash.io. Please uh, feel free to check that out on your, your browser either during or after the call. It's basically a venture funded laundrette. Now, on the one hand, that seems absolutely ridiculous. It's like, wait a minute, so you're in this uh, very saturated, very well understood, low margin business that generally uh, doesn't have as many large players, the laundry, laundry business. And you put a mobile app on it and suddenly you can raise a few million dollars from venture capitalists. But the interesting thing is there is a market which is more addressable by creating an app, by making it easy to interface with. And if somebody can do that within your industry or business, whether to consumers or business people, it absolutely gives them an opportunity to cut between you and your customer base and to disrupt your value chain. The interesting thing about user interfaces differentiator is every time the user interface, the predominant user interface changes, there is a whole rash of new opportunities, both for existing and new businesses. I remember back in the day when we were all talking about the, the platform wars. Microsoft definitively beat Apple in the 80s and 90s by having the operating system that at least in those days was on the vast majority of computers. Well, Google became incredibly valuable by effectively making the operating system irrelevant. The Google value proposition is, I don't much care whether you're using a, a simple little Chromebook, whether you're running Linux, whether you're on Mac OS, or whether you're using Windows, I don't care. I can still give you a lightweight office suite. I can give you access to productivity tools, uh, information, and pretty much anything else you'd need. So Google's success was in many ways a change to the platform or user interface to say, you know what, as long as you can slap a browser on it, I don't care what else is happening on your computer, we've got you from here. There are a couple of areas where we're going to see uh, changes in user interface. And a couple of the ones that I really want to mention for anyone who's not come across these is conversational commerce and then of course augmented virtual reality. As you can see, I was just skimming a book by O'Reilly, Design for Voice Interfaces. But Slack is perhaps one of the most interesting chat-based apps to blow up over the last couple of years. We're seeing providers like x.ai that will automate the process of scheduling. If you've ever had to have a meeting scheduled and you're like, can you do Tuesday at 2? How about Friday at 4? Can you come to my location or yours? Now you can simply add this artificially intelligent bot that currently is human assisted and the extra AI team are, are pretty tight lipped about how much of this is actually their algorithms today and how much of it is somebody sitting fixing stuff by hand but they've got a business model based around automating the process of scheduling meetings. There are companies like Magic which was thrown together in a weekend uh, by a Y Combinator company of the idea of uh, again, it's a conversational commerce interface where you simply text saying, I want this, that, or another. And what they will do is they will determine how to find that, they will uh, get your credit card information, and whatever problem you're looking to solve, they'll solve for you. It's going to be interesting to see how conversational commerce affects the ways that we interact with things like the web. Right now, most of these NLP or natural language processing, the process of actually taking human input and figuring out what we meant, is still really in the fairly early days. And to create a specific application using natural language processing or NLP takes quite a lot of engineering effort. That said, 
we're going to see increasingly over the next five to ten years there's a lot of engineering effort being put into simplifying this process and potentially this is going to disintermediate a lot of people that provide websites or apps because after all why do we go to a website typically it's either to learn something or do something and the chances are we're going to slowly over the next five to twenty years trend towards intelligent agents where in a Siri or Amazon Echo like way we simply express our intent I'd love to see if I could get away for the weekend somewhere warm because it's cold in New York and eventually we'll get probably through a text-based interface because it's kind of uh, laborious for a computer to just go speak to us paragraphs and paragraphs of information but probably through a text-based interface we're then going to see a pricey with three or four special offers on our favorite airlines uh, with hotels included. So potential, what does that do though to the, the travel companies, to the kayaks, to the uh, hotels or the booking.coms? Potentially it disintermediates them by creating another level of abstraction between the customer and the place where the, the, the supply is currently aggregated. Augmented and virtual reality. It reminds me of artificial intelligence in that this is one of these domains where we've been threatening it forever and it's a little bit like the boy who cried wolf. Nobody ever believes it's actually going to come. I remember getting particularly excited about VRML, the virtual reality markup language back in like 97 or 98. So it was almost 20 years ago and nothing useful came out of it. But to anybody who's played with uh, one of the Microsoft solutions or, or Oculus or who's seen the, the discussions around what Magic Leap is trying to launch. Uh, this is for anyone who hasn't come across it. Magic Leap is a company that's raised over $800 million with I think a $3.4 billion valuation from smart investors and doesn't yet even have a working product in the market and has no customers. So clearly there's a number of smart people who believe that they are augmented reality solution, adding additional information to the real world as opposed to virtual reality where you're going to close out the real world and just connect to, to this, this virtual universe is going to be a real thing very quickly. And again, it fundamentally transforms the ways in which we engage and interact with things. I think it was, it was not at all surprising to me that uh, Facebook spent a substantial amount of money buying Oculus because if you think about it in 10 years why would you want to be typing into Facebook when you could be sitting in a room, a virtual room with all of your friends from wherever they are around the world. Some other things I want to touch on is that I, I see as I look at the technology startups and the, the successful traditional organizations who are doing well within this world, the ones that are doing best are the ones with a, a brand or tone or attitude with a little bit of whimsy, a little bit of attitude. And I think it's becoming increasingly important to be less formal and, and less traditional, uh, both to access millennials and I, and I think just to differentiate yourself as this kind of next generation of providers, even if you uh, have been in business for many decades. One thing that, that's always challenging, and it, it's funny, uh, and, and I, I, I accept the irony of me giving a presentation in which I'm about to say, by the time somebody gives a presentation about something, maybe it's too late. My question for you is, I, I look at all of these courses and evening classes and resources now to learn how to do content marketing. As soon as everyone is teaching, best ways of doing content marketing, it's too late for those practices to be successful. It's the same with uh, modern marketing or growth hacking. The idea is as soon as people are teaching other people how to use a particular technique, it's unlikely to provide you with a meaningful competitive advantage. So a question I have for you is when you look at the teams that you're running and the people that you employ, it's great that you make sure that they get trained in the, the currently shared best practices. But my question for you is how many of your team are actually teaching? Because if you're not running the teams that are teaching other people, then all you're doing is getting secondhand innovation. And that's not going to keep your company ahead of the game. 
it's interesting as you start to think about historically when we look at the value say of a public company it's pretty straightforward it's it's based upon the likely net present value of the future dividends right so we're saying this is going to be this size and it's going to grow a bit bigger and it's going to be around for a certain number of years so if we do a net present value calculation we can at least from a value investing perspective come up with a, a reasonable approximation of the value for any particular business. One of the things that's been concerning me and a, a number of venture capitalists I've talked to over the last decade is what happens to that if every company starts to get disrupted increasingly frequently? I think it's going to be interesting to see how we value companies over time as any given advantage. Sure, there are some sustainable competitive advantages, right? Our pl patents and plant and relationships. But I think we're going to see that eventually the main sustainable competitive advantage that you can have is the quality of your team. And so I'm going to argue that one of the biggest challenges to succeeding in a technologically diverse, complex, and fastly changing future is building the team that is capable and passionate about working there. One of the things that's been most interesting to me, having a lot of experience in, a different, in addition to running my own engineering teams, I run CTO summits around the world where chief technology officers connect, from, connect with and learn from their peers. And as I speak to many of the top engineering leaders at successful fast growth startups, there's a fundamentally different way that they think about attracting and retaining the best talent. You see it already with things like top talent, 10 times management now, where top programmers, in addition to commanding salaries of a half million dollars a year or more, are also getting agents in the same way as rock stars or, or sports, sports professionals. And when I see on the, the company side, when you're trying to attract the top talent, the people who are presenting, the people who are teaching and building innovation, rather than just trying to copy from their peers, it's not about the foosball table in the pet friendly workforce. But there are some things that I find as I speak to, to top technologists and knowledge workers that they do value. How many of the companies that you work for as you think of your company, how would you feel having an engineering leader running your engineering team who worked out of Minnesota if your team was in New York or Colorado? How do you think about unlimited vacation or even required vacation? rather than tracking those 12 days a year, or even a results-only work environment? How do you feel about having a conversation on the day that you hire new staff, talking about specifically what you're going to help them to achieve in terms of their career trajectory over the next two to five years, so that then if they decide to move on to another organization, you've helped them to get to the right place, and maybe in a few years they'll come back and join you again. Uh, Etsy has career talks like that on a regular basis. Pivotal Labs, a very well respected software development shop, almost sometimes feels like a rest stop for programmers where they go out, do a startup for three years, and come back for three years, still adding value to that organization. One of the, the best books, and, and I'm sure most of you have come across this, but if not, if you wanted one book that I think summarizes the best way to build a relationship with and connect with some of the top talents, I love. Daniel Pink's book called Drive. It's pop psyche, but it, it's a very short and easy read. And if you were to build it, if you were to break it down to three words, it's about creating an environment that supports autonomy, mastery, purpose. Autonomy, not micromanaging your team, but rather allowing them to find the best way to achieve your business objectives. Mastery, leaving them a little time to do a good job rather than always be rushing to putting out fires and shipping the maximum number of features per unit time. And then of course purpose, connecting to some reason why they should care about your mission, whether it's charity water who's providing clean water around the world, or whether it's just providing more affordable insurance quotes for drivers in Connecticut. Whatever the level of the purpose or the mission is, it's much easier to get the best value from your team if in some ways you can connect to them there. And so I know that we're running towards the end of time, and so if I wanted to give one takeaway, it would be that I would recommend if you want to get the best value out of the new technologies that are arising, 
think about what you can do to create an environment to attract the most compelling team. And I think that would be a good point to, to break out and perhaps see how things happen in terms of questions and whether we can do some Q&A. Uh, we do have quite a, a few questions, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and start in on those. Um, we'll let you know when we're out of time, but we're going to get as many as we can in. The first one that we had uh, talks about uh, knowledge firms, service firms that offer expertise, such as a legal or accounting field. How do you think the technology disruptions will affect them, and what might they do to make sure that they're not made obsolete? So I think there's a huge challenge in terms of consulting organizations because the problem is much of what they do can be de-skilled and automated. And I think it, one of the, the good things is it, it's a function of the amount of data and the amount of variability. Uh, people often talk about like big data and AI and machine learning. The dirty little secret of big data is that it actually requires quite a lot of information. If I was in the business of preparing wills, uh, corporate formations, if we just take the, the legal area, or everyday IP agreements, I would feel like there is some value to be, to be obtained in terms of the interaction with a human, but I, I don't think that necessarily needs to be somebody with a law degree. So I would be very concerned about my ability to extract value for preparing wills, creating everyday IP agreements. It, Knowledge and information wants to be free, and the value of these contracts uh, and the preparation of these contracts is going to trend towards zero. The good news is that especially where there are a relatively small number of data points, when a small number of people want very customized solutions, I think we will over time see better decision support systems to surface the, the relevant case law, for example, and, and similarly tools like Watson in the medical field. Uh, but I do not necessarily see those companies being put out of business anytime soon. So I think that technology is going to be an enabler and a facilitator, but you're going to have to think very carefully about your, um, your billing structure and which niches you want to own because you're also going to be competing with companies around the world and to keep US based billing rates I think you're going to have to be particularly good at something that somebody can't get from India or the Philippines. Thank you. Uh, a few of you have written in to ask about the, the book that Peter mentioned so I've dropped that in the little instructions box. Um, the name of that book is Drive by Daniel Pink. If you go to his website, danpink.com, uh, you can find out some more information about that. So we, you had just mentioned um, talking about compensation innovations to attract top talent. In a more technologically diverse field, uh, what, are some, what is some advice you would offer to make sure that you, you have the best people that you need to get the job done? So uh, going back to the idea of education and the value of innovation, I would start by, if there's a particular domain or area you're in, it's often worth finding the people who speak at the regional conferences. If you want the very best talent, go speak to them. I, even if it's to the extent of go, if you wanted to hire a programmer, I'll take as an example, and they program using Ruby on Rails, a framework that lots of startups use, go to RailsConf and hang out in the hallways, uh, dress down a little, this is not the place for the suit, and just strike up a conversation with the speakers. Everyone other than perhaps the keynoter will be quite happy to chat with you. And the best way of starting that conversation is we're trying to solve this interesting purpose-driven problem, whatever it is, again, whether it's uh, fresh water in Africa or whether it's lower prices for consumers for their auto. It doesn't need to be a mission with a capital M. And then ask, do you know anybody who might be interested or passionate about helping us to solve a problem like that. And the nice thing about the do you know anybody is firstly if they're interested as a speaker, they can come straight up to you and say, well funnily enough I'm looking for a new job. And if not, it allows them to hand you off to other people who are also well networked because clearly they know some of the most uh, successful speakers in the space. So I find that's a really good way to get that first person or two. And generally my experience has been who's great at what they do, and who is also a strong communicator and well-networked, they will be by far the best source of leads as you start to try to scale out that team. And this is equally applicable to any type of, of knowledge work that I've come across today. 
for just one more question. Um, and so I'm going to go with one I saw earlier, which I liked, talking about people that are already in your organization. Uh, obviously, adaptability to change is an important feature for looking at, at new people and uh, new knowledge to bring into the org. How do you go about kind of opening up people that are maybe not as technologically um, literate or as interested in learning but still play an important role in your organization? How do you kind of bring them into the fold and uh, make them comfortable with innovation that's going on? So that's a great question. And there was an article in the New York Times about a week ago specifically about AT&T where it had a little bit of human interest where it was like the, the two brothers, one of whom had a very senior executive position, one of whom was still basically spooling wire and, and connecting buildings. And they were talking about the fact that AT&T is really trying to invent itself and to say that if you're not continually learning, you probably won't have a job. And one way or another, that, in, that, in, that message and information needs to be conveyed. I think it's hard because traditionally a lot of very large organizations have pounded that out of people. Education or learning, well that's the stuff you do if you're not busy, but if you're not busy we should fire you. Right? The idea that we're going to continually invest in training and curiosity. Uh, one of the best things you can do is make it okay to fail. I was speaking with uh, Todd Park, who used to be the CTO of America, the CTO of the USA, about when they, they fixed the healthcare.gov website. And it was this huge challenge where they had had a number of large traditional government consulting shops do a horrible job of building a bad website which uh, came online far too late, and somehow he had to turn this around and take the exact same group of people and fix it very quickly. And he said one of the turning points for him was when they got into this idea of daily stand-ups where everyone would kind of give, what did I do yesterday, what am I doing today, what's blocking me, and then any other business. And one of the things one of the people came up with one day was they said, I can't believe this, but I've lost user data. They'd done something stupid in the database. They had lost information and data, which was a huge problem for the organization at the time. What did Robert do? I uh, Todd do? He got everybody to give that person a round of applause. And the reason he did that was because the fact is humans are going to make mistakes. The only question is whether they are scared to tell you, in which case it's going to take nine months before you realize just how deep the hole is, or whether they are not scared to tell you, you support them, and then you figure out what policies, procedures, or other practices you can put in place to make sure that that same problem does not recur. So one of the most important things you can do is create a space that is supportive of learning, but that also allows failure so that people can take the risks required to try something new. Time we have for today. Um, to just as a reminder to those of you who are asking, we will be following up with a full recording of this webinar. You should get that probably by the end of the week, and we will send you an email. If you signed up for this webinar, you'll get an email from us that lets you know that that recording is available. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for your time. I see that you put your Twitter handle um, on the slide there. Is that a good way for people to follow you, to get updates, to, to see what you're reading and what, what is uh, catching your eye and interest? Absolutely. So there's two things I'd suggest both on the slide. One is there's my Twitter handle, at Peter Bell. The other is if you want to make a connection on LinkedIn, uh, which is the primary way I manage my professional connections, if you go to bit.ly slash Peter F. Bell, F for Freddy, Peter F. Bell, that will take you straight to my LinkedIn page, and please feel free to connect. Great. Thank Matthew, you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. Again, Peter Bell will be teaching the Dig Digital Literacy for Decision Makers program at Columbia Executive Education. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, either by email or through social media. To everyone else, have a great day. Thank you so much for your time.